Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the second part of the recent results session. I'm Rina Samani from Yukona. Yukona run the academic and research network in the UK called Janet. Okay, the aim of this session is to provide members of the Terrena community an opportunity to present the results of their development project. In this session, we have four presentations today. The first presentation is by Ted Hans from Internet2 in the United States. His presentation is titled, A Federated Approach to Distributed Video-Enabled Meetings. Okay, over to you, Ted. Thank you, Rena. What I'm going to talk about is a, an effort that we've had underway for the last few months in part to try and get some reaction from people here who have the ideas or suggestions about uh, ways we can implement this, uh, the approach we want to have for, for really supporting uh, video-enabled meetings. And when I talk about meetings, I mean everything from, you know, sort of a, you know, a conference uh, meeting across, you know, a couple of point to point or an event like the Trina Conference where you have participants who are participating regardless of where they are which means that in, instead of just you know, streaming out into the broader network, you can have participants sitting uh, wherever they are in the world interacting with us, asking questions from, uh, from the virtual audience. This is driven from, the, uh, from our experiences in the last few months with the uh, Virtual Internet 2 member meeting and the work that we were doing on the Internet 2 Commons, which is our national video conferencing program in, uh, in Internet 2 and then our uh, monthly activities around uh, virtual briefings. So I say I'm, I'm presenting this in, in part to get, uh, to get your reaction. The last slide I'll, I'll show a uh, URL to get your own copies of these slides. Uh, I've, I've actually hidden about uh, half of the slides in this presentation to give a little bit more detail on the, on the points that I'm making in here. But I want to first talk about the, the motivation for this. For the last several years, Internet 2 has been streaming its sessions uh, for people who can't physically be where we are in Washington, D.C., or San Francisco, or Atlanta, or Seattle. Uh, but we were forced, with the circumstances after September 11th, to adjust how we were using the technology. We had our uh, fall member meeting scheduled just a couple of weeks after September 11th, and people were uh, leery of traveling. And so we decided to cancel the in-person part of the meeting and replace it with an entirely uh, virtual meeting. And we had just, uh, just about a, a week of uh, you know, business days to, to work together to make this happen. And we initially decided just to collapse what was a four-day meeting into a one day of, of plenary talks that we would uh, distribute, again, via the, the network technology. Uh, and we wanted the basis for it all to be MPEG-2 because one of the avenues for distribution, in addition to interactive video conferencing, was to send it over a, a satellite link for cable, uh, university cable networks to pick up and put across the cable TV on their campuses and in their communities. Well, in, as I say, in addition to that, we also uh, sent this out and, uh, and transcoded into a number of different formats, uh, real H.263, VRVS, and so forth down the line, and again, allowing people using these technologies, the interactive ones, to ask questions back to, this, to these speakers. Uh, now, this the picture was was fairly complicated in, in fact that it included several uh, satellite hops to get the feeds back and forth and then as you can see a whole you know, uh, a large number of machines serving as encoders for the video conferencing including as I say uh, one-way streaming like the real and and so on IPTV as well as interactive such as the polycoms the access grid and so forth well, we had a the user interface to this meeting was a web page that you went to where you picked the sessions and the tracks that you were participating in, and you could go there and you could find information about uh, the speaker, get information about him or her, and then get copies of their slides in either PowerPoint source or HTML. You could email questions back, and we would have someone moderating right there, as well as uh, go back later if you miss a talk and see the archives. And we had various, we had chat rooms too, in addition to email, you could do real-time chat with some of the, the presenters. Well, in addition to that one day of plenary, we added several uh, other days, went to the, in fact, the rest of the week, using primarily H323-based video conferencing for the sessions, so that we, 
uh, our idea was to, in fact, try and replicate as much of the meeting as possible. And the net result, in fact, was that we had over 90 presenters presenting at this meeting, uh, literally from all over the world. And we were able to actually replicate two-thirds of, of the overall meeting content using this technology. And what we found, in fact, was that some of the sessions actually had more virtual participants than there would have been if they had come to Austin, Texas, where our in-person meeting was going to happen, and were able to sit in, uh, sit in on it. In fact, we received uh, about 8,000 unique individuals participating in this meeting when we usually get about between six and 700 participants in the in-person meeting. So we found that this was one, uh, the results were that this is a successful way to, to have, as I say, truly global participation in a virtual meeting on an interactive basis. Now, people don't want to do away with in-person meetings, and so we're not going to you know, stop holding our twice yearly in-person meetings, but we want to use this technology more broadly. And so we made a commitment from that point to go forward on using it as a model for, for all other uh, Internet 2 activities and trying to engage other organizations in using the content. Uh, there's an uh, organization uh, based in the States with international participation called EDUCAUSE that we uh, worked with them in a spring meeting to, uh, to use this technology uh, for, uh, uh, for some uh, participation in a session. And in fact, we're taking Larry Lessig's talk from last Monday uh, afternoon, and we're going to be rebroadcasting it uh, from in, next week in the States, and then following it with a Q&A by Molly Van Howling, who is the executive director of the Creative Commons that he talked about. So having both a replay of the session as well as a live interactive chat with that. So where we want to go is we, we threw together, as I say, in about a week, the set of technologies to make this happen. And the question is, how can we provide on an ongoing basis the set, that set of capabilities, not just for meetings that are occurring uh, in that site, but for uh, making it available as a network service? You know, essentially, what's our a distributed director studio? We're going to have remote presenters do titling and graphics, uh, transcoding, uh, archiving, all the control we want to do without having to rack all this equipment and send it to every meeting site that we want to, uh, to use it. We can have it all available on the network. And that's what I want to come back to is, is how that might be architected. Now, what we're using to, to do this is something we call the Internet 2 Commons, which, as I said at the beginning, it's our national uh, video conferencing activity uh, that we're using to encourage and support uh, from casual to more formal interactions in, uh, in our academic and research community. And this, uh, this is a, a production service today that's been focused initially on video conferencing. Uh, talk in a second here that we're actually looking to expand it to a broader set of services over the next year. So for the last year, though, it's been focused on, on video conferencing. Uh, we have a management committee that f looks at the operational and development aspects of it. And uh, Egon Varharan on the back there is a man member of the management team to ensure that what we do uh, remains compatible on an on a international basis. And so some of the work that's being done on the international dialing plan will be adopting within the Internet 2 Commons to make sure we're staying in coordination with the broader community. So we now have significant MCU capacity that we've, we've had for the last year. Uh, available for you know, in excess of 100 simultaneous connections. Uh, we also make available streaming from that uh, set of services. And we're working now on training and certifying people on individual campuses to be the point people for this set of video conferencing services. So when we're talking about doing this, I'm talking about uh, doing it in, as part of this broader Internet 2 Commons activity, which includes the sort of production side, as well as an R&D exploration into things like we're doing the, the first with DVTS as a firewire camera uh, video conferencing environment over IPv6 that we demonstrated last month at the Internet 2 member meeting. Uh, we've been working on extending the access grid from H.261 codecs to, uh, to including motion JPEG for higher quality imagery and so on and so forth. So there's, there's within the Internet 2 Commons, we have both a production side and an R&D side. And as I said, we're moving in the future to try and incorporate some additional technologies for things such as, as a, uh, data sharing, uh, application sharing, uh, more tools for archiving the data. And we reported on this at our, our spring member meeting, and we'll be finishing up that report this fall, or this, uh, this spring. 
And as I say, all this is all important to this set of technologies because when we want to have these interactive meetings, it's just not about the audio and video. It's also about how you can have application sharing. It's about how you can uh, archive that content and easily have it uh, uh, indexed and searched. So bringing back to the, our, our use of this, we've, uh, since this, the virtual member meeting in, in last uh, September, we've been holding monthly what we call virtual briefings to bring the community up to date on, on certain topics. And the idea we're trying to find is how would you find that optimal mix of the quality of the collaboration, you know, the audio and video codec, and the breadth of the audience that we want to get to, and again, supporting their activity. And these things often fight against each other. Uh, that it's often, you know, if you want to do a highest quality MPEG-2, you know, it's a much smaller community that can, that can, uh, can view it. And as I say, we have to provide a production-oriented service, but continue to explore the technologies. And this list here that we've been using each month is uh, similar to the list I showed for the, the virtual briefing that we did uh, that kicked it off in the, for our fall member meeting. And then we want to support all these technologies, so we're not dictating to the users what technology they may be using at their, at their end station. And I'll note here in, a, in on the slide that we also don't want to shoot for the lowest common denominator. So if someone is on you know, an MPEG-2 connection, they see any MPEG-2 sources at that quality level. So we don't transcode it all down to the, to the lowest quality. And there's some real challenges here because a lot of the paradigms for interaction differ. So for example, you take something like H323 and the access grid, you know, there is the model of you know, an MCU and H323 where an administrator can mute endpoints, but in the access grid, it's a big party line. And how do you start managing and supporting challenges like floor control in an environment where you're mixing those together. That is, we want the ability of someone sitting in an access grid node enabled room to ask a question, have that be heard by someone sitting in a conference room looking at a polycom end station, or in all this being observed by someone who's sitting at their desk watching an IPTV stream or a real stream or Windows Media Player stream. And so that's what we're, we're oriented to is trying to, again, support multiple technologies and continue to support the, the production values expected from a, a professionally presented meeting. So, and this is the, the core of what I wanted to, to, to show you all was that, you know, the, to do this takes a lot of uh, boxes again. And this is similar to the picture I showed before, but we're not showing all the details of the encoders here. But we tried to break things up a little bit in terms of, there's also the issue of testing. And that is how can the speakers test with each other and then later bring in the audience? And then you're, again, that you're using the same kind of technology, you can't really block people out because we don't have the whole authentication authorization piece worked out. So we started playing with using different MCUs. So we get all the speakers together half an hour early, and they're all interacting with each other over an H323 MCU. And then right at the you know, top of the hour when we start the session, we then join, cascade the, the two MCUs, and suddenly everybody's communicating as part of the same session. So that works if H323 is going to be the core of what we're trying to do. And again, there's the advantages of H323. You know, it's a commercially supported technology. There are the ability to, to you know, selectively, selectively mute endpoints because the biggest hassle we have are people who leave their, their, uh, their mics open at the endpoint and interfere with the, uh, the presentation or the interactions of others. But that runs counter to our goal of having uh, supporting the, those who want to see at the highest quality level, maintain at the highest quality level. So, for example, when we have our, our own studio in our office with a local moderator, you know, we're capturing that at MPEG-2 level, how do we again get that out? So we're looking at trying to design essentially a, 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 that director studio I talked about with a uh, box that will sit in the middle. You can see this distribution amp right here. We will we'll add a video switcher to it and a couple other uh, audio mixers as well and have that be a protocol independent MCU, for lack of a better, a better title, so that we can actually have multiple feeds coming into it regardless of the codec. And that box make the decision of, of how we present the, uh, the, the audience. We could do you know, the full grid type image like you do with H323 using some of the some video processors. Uh, we could do some uh, metering on the audio mixer and look for you know, the, the last speaker or the loudest speaker of a sustained period 
and switch to that individual. You know, all the same things that you find inside an H.223 MCU, but we're building it in a more sort of open designed environment. Now, the question of how, about go, how do we go about doing that, and you know, we started building up, we, as I say, we have a distribution amp now that feeds all our encoders and, uh, and we're, now, we're adding a video mixer to it to take, to take all the remote feeds. Uh, again, trying to do some software control on it that will they'll look at the audio levels and decide who, uh, who, will, who will participate. Uh, the, we've been looking for you know, some things we could buy to do this. And the only one we found so far that comes close to us is a box that Miranda makes, but is extremely expensive. I don't know, has anybody here had ex experience with a, the Miranda MPEG-2 MCU? So as I say, it's, it, it's, a, it's a very expensive box. They're uh, in the starting off sort of you know, $50,000 range and going up depending on how many codecs you add to it. But we want to have that kind of functionality without necessarily investing that, that same sort of level. And then what we want to get to is you know, run this as a director's studio within our own environment, but then make it available as a network-based service so someone can actually go and book this. So you're having a meeting you know, between some participants, or you're running a conference, and you want to have the same kind of functionality. That is, you want to stream, for example, out of one camera, an MPEG-2 stream to this facility, it would then automatically encode it in all the data formats that you've selected out to the broader world without you having to maintain all those boxes or bring them to the meeting venue. And we're also looking, therefore, at the scheduling software that will be make that possible. Is that how can you actually schedule all these devices and reserve it so this network-based resource is available to people. So as I say, this was the, the, the core of what I wanted to get, is that we're, we're on this path to continually extend our meetings into a virtual space in order to extend the reach and the audience participation. Again, always trying to make this interactive. And at the same time, look at how we can turn this into a stable, reservable production environment for other people. So what I'm curious about are, you know, are others thinking about something like this and how we might work together? Because one of the things that would be you know, obvious would be uh, uh, Egon talked on uh, the, task, the ta streaming task force on Sunday about doing some more academic content sharing. And you know, on our box, we could put a PAL to NTSC conversion for the MPEG-2 streams, take a feed in from, uh, from Europe, and then redistribute it within North America and vice versa. Again, if we set up some way of coordinating doing that. Uh, similarly, you know, the issue of one reason why we're rebroadcasting Larry Lessig's talk from last week, you know, the time at which it's held is, you know, in the middle of the night on, in the west coast of the U.S. And so, you know, people didn't ever really have a chance to see it, even if they, you know, uh, had connectivity here. So there's also the time shifting issue that we need to work on. So, throw it back to you. Is this kind of infrastructure of interest, and are other people working on the issues of, you know, protocol independent? Uh, MCUs in a production environment with titling and, and control in the same way that, uh, again, you might have in an H323 MCU world, but we want to do in a protocol independent way. No? Yes? So, let, me, let, me, so let me ask, you know, I'll see if there are any questions about anything I just talked about then. <laughs> yes? Did you? You're, you're, you're doing something like that? Or? Microsoft. Yeah. We are in the we, we have been uh, um, uh, doing some one to one exchanges with uh, the US and uh, to NIH. Yeah. So uh, the. Uh, is anybody else doing sort of real time transcoding in multiple formats? Of, hang on. Another thing I should mention that we're working on, we're also working on a way of getting uh, closed captioning uh, in this environment as well. Another reason why we want to have a logically centralized environment is to support accessibility to the, uh, uh, to the deaf and hearing impaired. And one way to do that is to provide a consistent way of doing it across, uh, across higher education by providing an interface into this environment. And always, anybody else, is anybody working on trying to incorporate uh, closed captioning into video conferencing environments? One of the issues we have in the states is that if you have a federally funded program, you do have to provide accessibility functions such as closed captioning to, uh, to your webcasts. 
And that's one of the things that's motivating the work in that area. Well, of course we have a difficult problem here since everyone has to do it in their own language. Yeah, well, that, and that's what I was saying. One of the, right. I mean, one of the things we ran into was that there are, you know, there are, there are consistent ways of doing it within the broadcast television arena. But when you start talking about doing a webcast environment, I talked to, you know, eight different companies, and they had eight different approaches for doing it. And then you multiply that by, you know, each language, or, you know, then, then you've got a much more complex environment. And if we could sort of stabilize it down to at least a, a more consistent way of doing it, and then worry about the complexity of, of language differences on top of that, then it becomes a, a, a little bit more tractable problem. Okay. Oh. Michael. So, Ted, as, as you know, I think about infrastructure. And one thing that I'd be concerned about, at least in terms of what I know about video, it's um, labor intensive. You need a lot of people to set up an environment that you've talked about. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the number of people involved, the technical expertise, and what concerns you might have about uh, some kind of infrastructure that would be able to support the environment. So you Right. Well, I, I think the, the, the motivation here was that to, to do this meeting room by meeting room is more labor intensive than you can you could imagine. I mean, in terms of bringing in the encoders and configuring them and making sure you're pointing at, at uh, you know, real uh, servers out there that are working. And what this model we're trying to do is, is get all that back end operation into one place in a stable environment and run it hands off. And so at the meeting room, a room like this, it would be as easy, the easiest configuration would be to take a FireWire camera and a laptop, point a stream from that right to this service, and after you click a few buttons on a web page, and then it then sets up all the, in, the encoders. And, and, that's, and that's what we're, I mean, we're, we're at the point now where we have, you know, when we do these events, we have a guy sitting there doing it all, but we're going to want to replace the guy sitting there with uh, with software-based control. But you, but you also have other people who are involved in configuring the MCUs, monitoring all of this right. while things are going on. I doubt that that's all one person, because from what you described, that's spread throughout. Right. Well, we have, there, but uh, in the configuration way, we, whenever we do these, we always have one person on the MCUs and, and, and watching that. And at this point, uh, you know, don't you know? Don't see how we're going to get away with having somebody there because we, you know, again, that's part of a, a twenty-four, you know, seven by twenty-four type of operations. Uh, but I think that so we're never going to make this completely hands-free. But I think what we're going to do is that one of the bigger, biggest barriers for doing this on just sort of casually established meetings is the fact that you have to go and find, you know, experts to bring up you know, all the various encoders, and we're trying to just eliminate all that part of it. So it's not going to be completely hands-free, but in terms of you know the encoders, dealing with the, the the mixing of the of the audio signals, all that work is just part of a, a network-based service. Could you say something about the cost of this central location? Well, this right now, I mean the the uh, cost of the boxes, uh, I mean the things like distribution amps and mixers and so forth. I mean we've probably spent somewhere around I'd say around forty thousand dollars for the equipment. And then, you know, if you, if you add, every, every encoder you add depends on a, a, a cost for there. You know, MPEG-2 encoders can cost you five to $10,000. Real encoders are the cost of the, the machines, again, three to $5,000. So. Okay. Thanks, Rena. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ted. Okay, do we have any more questions? No? Okay, we'd like to move on to the second speaker for today. It's uh, Alan Smeaton from Dublin City University in Ireland. His presentation is titled The Fischler Digital Library Networked Access to a Video Archive of TV News. Okay, Alan, over to you when you're ready.
learn how to pronounce it properly. Fishkar is an Irish word. The fact that it's not an Irish word, it's a bastard word. It's a bastard Irish word because fish is the Irish for video and crawler is the Irish for program. So you put the two together and you get fish crawler. I apologize. <laughs> Sets us up probably as group favourites to qualify from that group if we step it around. Um, and that's an indication of the kind of happiness which is spreading throughout the country. Right now. Um, the microphone, the microphone is too low, is it? Better? 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 No? No, no. That sounds better. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, I, our, our research group is about 20 individuals, and, and we do uh, research into audio analysis and video analysis. And the kind of audio analysis that we do is, is um, speaker recognition and speaker identification, speaker tracking, um, and speech music discrimination. And on the video side, we do analysis of things um, to do uh, face recognition and face identification. And we will do text OCR from digital video. And we will do object segmentation and object tracking. But this group of academic researchers um, as well as just producing academic papers on our topics, what we do is we bundle everything into a single system, uh, which we've made available uh, on our campus, which is called Fischklar. So most of the research that we do goes into this single system. So we write those papers, uh, and then we, uh, um, uh, we put it into the system. And what Fischklar does is it does recording of broadcast TV. It does analysis of that TV, which I'll describe in a moment, and it allows people to do browsing of that TV content. Um, having navigated your way through the archive or the library of digital, uh, digitally recorded TV content, we then support playback uh, of the digital video. Uh, and the co content that we allow uh, recording and navigation and playback from is TV, broadcast TV from eight major terrestrial channels which are uh, subscribed to in the Dublin area. Um, that's BBC One, BBC Two, Channel Four, ITV, and the four Irish stations, for those of you from the UK who may recognize some of those. The way it works is that people will use Fischklar and will select programs um, from the TV schedule, the online electronic program guide that we provide, um, and they will choose programs that they wish to have re recorded, just like you do on a TiVo box or on a conventional VCR. The TV schedules that are provided for us um, have a textual description of the program, and they also have automatic genre assigned to them. So there's about 12 or 14 categories like sports, soaps, documentaries, nature programs, sci-fi, cartoons, etc., etc. And every program is categorized into uh, one or more of these categories. So a user can browse the TV schedules by channel or by genre, see a program they want, click on a, a, a button, and it will be recorded for them. When the program is broadcast, we then capture it in MPEG-1 format. We automatically detect the boundaries between camera shots, and we will detect uh, for certain types of applications the boundaries between scenes, where a scene is made up of multiple camera shots. Um, for shots and scenes over a certain length, we will select keyframes as indicators of the content. And then users can then browse, browse through the program archive, uh, choose a program that they wish to browse through, a specific program, and then browse through the keyframes within that program, and then subsequently take them, uh, that will then take them to uh, playback. We also capture teletext, or the closed captions that's associated with programs, um, and most of the TV that's broadcast in this part of the world is now closed captioned. And we do that 24-7 for six of the eight channels. We don't do it for the Irish language channel because it doesn't do teletext, and I can't remember, I, can't, I don't know why the reason is why we don't, why we don't do it to the, um, uh, or the UK one. Having captured the teletext, we can then start to investigate text-based searching through this closed caption, which we would have captured. Um, the previous speaker had a laser uh, pointer. Did, did you leave it here, or did you go away with it? Is that remote? It's this one. Is it the remote? This look? Oh, I'm afraid to press buttons now. So which, which button is it? Can you remember? Oh, the one marked laser. Oh. 
Okay. Um, Fishgar is very popular. Um, we developed it as a system just to demonstrate gluing the bits on audio analysis and speaker, uh, uh, speaker discrimination and so on, etc. But we found that its popularity grew, probably, probably because we were providing content which was online TV. So it's very popular on our campus environment, and we have about 1,800 registered users. We did an analysis of the log files recently, and we found that there's only about 850 of those users are regular users. The others would have been tried it once and then moved on to other things, other, other times. Um, during term time or during semester, we can have recorded anything up to 22, 23, 24 hours of broadcast TV is recorded uh, on the archive, and that's recorded per day. So we have a fixed size archive. More stuff gets recorded, and we just dump old stuff off in the end. Uh, it's used on our campus from the computing labs. Uh, from our residences, there's about 600 people live on our campus, and each of those are wired uh, to the net. And, and an old PC, like an old 200 megahertz Pentium, will be sufficient to, to stream the, and browse the video from. So it's used from the residences, it's used from the university library uh, on our campus, and soon it will be available in universities elsewhere in Ireland, in Galway and in Limerick, where we are here. Though not to, broad, not to, to browse and stream any kind of TV content, but specifically to browse and stream just news content. What's it used for? Well, inevitably, it's entertainment, and the most popular program that is recorded is The Simpsons, as you would expect, um, followed closely by Friends um, and, and other, other sitcoms. So it is used for entertainment because we do have this population of users who use it from their residences. But it's also used for research and, uh, and also for teaching and learning. On our campus, we have courses in film and TV production and media studies and journalism, etc. Uh, so students will have, or lecturers or faculty will have recorded current affairs programs or news programs, and this is then provided and is accessible from our main library and also shortly from the libraries in other universities as well. Um, in addition to allowing anybody to record any content from any channel, we also explicitly record RTE1, which is like the main national broadcaster. We record their main evening TV news, and we've been doing that every day going back to about last uh, July or August. Uh, we can store on our video server up to 300 hours of content, uh, which equates to about four, uh, 400 TV programs, and that's the volume of information that is online at any time. And the video server that we have, which is in a Sun Enterprise 4500, uh, can support up to 200 simultaneous playbacks. We have a gigabit Ethernet backbone which supports all this, so we don't address networking problems. We just throw a big gigabit Ethernet backbone at it, and people can stream from that. Uh, each MPEG-1 stream is 1.5 megabits per second. This is some screen dumps from the system, and really the screen dumps don't do it justice. And what, I, what I'll do after, after this session is, if you want to, you can join me at the HEA net stand, which is out and that way, and I'll show to you what it looks like live. But this is a screen dump of what the, um, the recording uh, screen looks like. What we have is the TV listings available for today and for tomorrow from the eight major channels uh, there and there. And we also can browse the content which is to be transmitted tonight uh, by these genres. Um, we have selected, I don't know what it is, RT1 tomorrow, uh, and this is each program, its time of transmission, a textual descriptor, and so on like that. Anything that has that kind of an icon beside it, somebody has recorded it. It may have been me, it may have been anybody, but it's just publicly recorded and made available to the community. These thumbs up and thumbs down uh, signs here allow each individual uh, to rate a program. When I use this system, I'm logged in as myself, so it is able to personalize the content for me. So I can say things like, I really don't like whatever that first program is there, which is Home and Away, which is a sitcom, and I really do like, um, or I really don't like Shortland Street, which is another sitcom, and I really don't like something else, etc. So what it does is, we then have an interface to a personalization recommender system, and I can just look at the recommendations icon, and what it will do is, from across the eight channels, it will come up with the recommendations for me uh, that I can look at for, for, to have recorded for me. Once a program has been recorded um, or transmitted and digitized, we then do analysis on that. And the analysis takes a little bit less than real time. So an hour program will take about 50 minutes to, to do the shot boundary detection and the keyframe analysis. And once it's been analyzed, it can, then gets thrown into uh, the library. When this screen dump was taken um, a couple of months ago, um, this is the size of the scroll bar. It goes from there down to there. But this little bit here corresponds to this volume of programs which are available at that point in time. Okay? Um, and I can scroll up and down through these things. Here, I can, from this drop-down menu, I can just look at all television or just, just the soaps or just the sports programs, and I will have that 
section reduced for me. I've chosen in this case to, to look at the 9 o'clock news, which is broadcast, 9 o'clock news and weather, which is broadcast on the station called RT1. It lasted 30 minutes, and that was the date of transmission. And now what I do is I go in to look at the keyframes. Um, and again, this doesn't do it justice. But what I have is a scroll bar on the top here, and you can probably make out the bars, the vertical bars, uh, dividing it into segments. Each one of those, those boxes or rectangle corresponds to 24 keyframes. So there's the beginning of the program, the end of the program, and I can just go click, 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 click through a palette of 24 keyframes. This, this box here corresponds to um, one, uh, 17 minutes 30 seconds into, 34 seconds into the program, and this whole thing corresponds to 2 minutes 39 seconds of that 30-minute broadcast. So this is a way for me to quickly browse through the content, and I can just sit there go click, 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 and when that comes up, I'll say, I'll recognize that as being a story about a politician who was jailed for something like that, and I'll move on and move on and move on. Um, when I click on any keyframe, then it can start to... This doesn't sound like it's working, does it? Okay, when I click on a keyframe, it will then start to play back in MPEG-1 uh, format, and MPEG-1 is... Um, <coughs> Lost this button. MPEG-1 is 380 something by 280 something pixels, and that's what it looks like. I can preview that in full screen, and it will basically look like poor quality VCR, almost VCR quality. Um, I'll just do two things. No. Okay. Um, so that will be streamed from the video streamers. This, 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 this is on, yeah? This is on? Okay. Um, okay, this is another way of browsing through the keyframes. In this case, what happens is the keyframes for the entire program are played as a slideshow. And this works particularly well on a, on a handheld PDA where you don't have an awful lot of real estate screen size. Here we're basically just flicking through the keyframes. I can speed them up or I can slow them down. Or I can put my mouse over this scroll bar. And as I do so, this little thing pops up with a micro keyframe. Or if anybody can come up with a term to describe what a small version of a keyframe is. But I can literally go along like this with my mouse. And this thing will rapidly preview the keyframes for me. Um, another browser interface is this one here. Um, uh, this isn't our original idea, but it comes from somewhere else. But it's a hierarchical browser. There's the beginning of the program. There's the end of the program. And if I mouse over these, what happens is the second level pops up. And currently, I have my mouse over this, so it expands into this set. But it isn't just two levels. It goes down to three levels. So I've actually gone and moved my mouse to over there, then down to there, and then down to there, and then down to there. So a little bit of dexterity with the wrist can allow me to navigate through what is, what is a total of 451 keyframes for that 30-minute broadcast. Okay? And the final keyframe browser interface we have is this one here. There's 36 keyframes. There's the first and there's the last. And they're presented as a stack of cards, each one of equal size. And if I just leave my mouse resting gently on any one of these, what happens is it presents a slideshow of that stack of cards. And you can see a scroll bar just about there as it goes flick, 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 flick through those keyframes. So this is keyframe-based browsing through the video content. And what we do currently is we allow people to record programs. We will index it by the keyframes by using shot boundary detection, scene boundary detection, and keyframe extraction. And we will support browsing and playback. But we're developing new ways in which we can allow people to interact with the digital video. We're allowing searching of our digital uh, library of video specifically for the main evening news. Because we capture the teletext, we have a text archive, and we can support very simple kind of search interfaces to allow people to search for, you know, um, news stories on Roy Keane and Mick McCarthy, and it will go and it will rank the news stories and find the offsets within the news stories where that particular item is discussed. Um, we are also um, supporting alerting on transmission of certain materials, so we have had an alerting system working, whereby if you're interested in breaking news stories on Roy Keane and Mick McCarthy, you put that into a profile. The teletext is being captured from, the H, from six channels uh, 24 hours a day, so it's been analyzed and it can be matched against a profile, and you can be sent an email alert with the link back to the offset in the video where that is played, or you can have it routed to your SMS phone. Um, and we're also working on summarizing programs, in particular sm summarizing sports programs. Sports and soccer are the theme of this, of, of this uh, conference, as you can probably gather. We have been able to analyze um, a football match, a 90-minute football match, and by measuring and detecting when there is a slow motion, in other words, an action replay, an indicator of content, we can also detect and measure the excitation level of the crowd by segmenting the commentator from the background noise, so when the crowd goes, yeah, 
you know, that's usually an indicator of some, some uh, lively event that's happened. And we can also analyze the, the, the voice and the excitation level of the commentator. And that as he or she gets really excited and Roy Keane has got... Right? We can detect that. So using the slow motion, the action replay, the excitation level of the commentator and the background, we can identify the, the, the important or the highlight parts in the sports video. Uh, the UEFA Cup final last year was between Liverpool and some other continental team. Uh, and it ended up being 5-4 uh, after extra time. We summarized the one hour and 20 minutes programs into five minutes. And in the five minutes, we got eight of the nine goals and the penalty that should have been a penalty. Okay? And that's just done uh, automatically. Um, another thing we're working on is automatic linking and weaving together of video segments. So there's an archive of news programs. You know? in, in our case, we have these going back to last July, each one being 30 minutes. And what happens with news is that there's an event that happens, it's reported in the news, and if it's an ongoing event, it's reported the next day and the next day and the next day. And sometimes it goes cold for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, and then it comes back again. There's a murder Okay? Then there's a, a, a murder hunt, and then there's a capture, and then there's a trial, and then there's a sentencing, etc. Well, what we can do is by using the uh, text associated, the closed captions associated with the video, we can identify uh, links between related clips. Okay? In Ireland, we would use examples of tribunal or a politician being caught, being passed a brown envelope, uh, being repeatedly appearing in various news uh, items. So what we can do is through our archive of news, not just support text-based searching of the closed captions, but also automatic linking or hyperlinking, if you like, of related news segments. Now, this depends upon us being able to take a 30-minute broadcast of news, take out the adverts, which is easy to do, because they all have a single black frame uh, between the adverts and the programs and, uh, and a moment of silence, and segment the news program into news stories. Segmenting video into different camera shots we can do. Segmenting camera shots and grouping them into scenes, we can do. But then grouping scenes into individual news stories is something that we're working on. So a news program of 30 minutes may have 12 or 14 or 16 news stories. And if we can segment them into stories, like those red and, and green dots there, and then create links between news-related uh, items. We can use the teletext to help us with this, but we can also use other things, like the background image behind the anchor person is normally a good indicator of the content of the story. Um, the work is very visual. The work we do is very visual, but to develop these functionalities, we're doing an awful lot of analysis of the video, and we're just bundling it into this nice demonstrator system, which we call FeedClaw. We do audio analysis, we do image processing, we do information retrieval, we do motion analysis of the video, we do storage management, because we have a big video server that does all this. We do user interface design, because we have keyframe navigation stuff, and we do video coding. Um, the platforms that we use, well, up to now it's been uh, available on a desktop, conventional Netscape or IE browser with a, a plug-in for the video streamer. Um, and from that you can select the recording, but we've also supported selecting of recorded programs via an SMS message. So you send an SMS message saying REC space RTE1 space 2000 will record whatever program is on, uh, uh, on RTE channel at a given time. But we started to develop full access from a wireless PDA, including payback. Um, and this is a screenshot of, what, of the system that we've developed. From our database, which describes the metadata for all the content, we can then pull out an XML document to describe each program and include all of its keyframes. And then we have an XSL transformation which can render that on a mobile PDA. And you can't really see the wireless LAN card sticking out at the top, but take my word for it, it does work. Um, we can't, however, stream yet to this, to this device uh, from our current server because what we have done is we encode all of the video in MPEG-1 format. But earlier on, I, was, I had this device uh, and I was watching uh, the USA against Portugal uh, live, uh, live TV being transmitted in MPEG-4 format. So we're going to have to re-engineer our system in order to support MPEG-1 and MPEG-4 encoding. Nice reference to the presentation earlier on about dual encoding into different formats. Um, in summary, Fishclar is a robust digital video library system which supports real people. We have hundreds of users, and they have got real information access needs, study, research, and, of course, entertainment as well. We also support video analysis and indexing, plus video browsing, video playback, and a limited form of searching, which we're developing further and further. The Fishclar news system, which is specifically the archive of recorded TV news, is the basis for the work that we're doing on automatically linking of related news stories and video clips. Okay, thank you, Alan.
Questions? David. A regular question we get asked, because the, co the content that we have is copyright everybody else except ourselves, there are four conditions under which we allow use. First is that we don't, describe, sorry, we don't uh, deprive the uh, broadcasters of the revenue stream, so we don't strip out adverts, we don't charge for it, um, we know who all our users are because you have to log in and register, and this is the, this is the, you have to be on the DCU campus, so it's not accessible to the outside world. But if you really want to, I can give you a password and you can play with it. <laughs> You can edit that bit out, okay? What about the software? Is the software available? No, the software isn't available for outside use. We, we, little bits of it, like the shot boundary detection and, and uh, the keyframe selection mechanism and the audio analysis, we've made some of that available and we've, we've described it at length in, in papers that we've written. Yep. Okay. Everything is done completely automatically. There is no manual intervention whatsoever. The shot boundary detection, the extraction of keyframes, the importing of the, of the TV schedules, uh, everything is done completely automatically. So, zero, I think, is the answer to your question. Uh, we, we have no interaction with the broadcasters because we take the content which is uh, transmitted over, over terrestrial broadcast. We just have a television aerial or a subscription to a, a cable TV provider, and that's where we get the content. We don't get the content directly from the broadcasters. We get it through the transmission network. But when uh, a user uh, selects the program from where are uh, taken uh, the Oh, yes. We import TV listings from another university who have a project on, on personalization. So we just import uh, an electronic program guide from somebody else. It's a third party service which somebody provides for us. Is that, it, it, it's the TV listings that you're asking about, is it? Um, yeah. maybe, maybe you'd like to take that okay. offline or something. One last question up there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, well, sorry. So the question was, how long does the program stay available for viewing? We have, um, we have an archive which can support 300 hours, so it depends upon how much, is, how much else is being recorded before the old stuff gets bumped off. We have a very simple al algorithm. Just bump off the old stuff. And yes, we get requests, oh, can you keep that episode of Friends or 24 or whatever online? And the answer is always no. Okay? Because if we started to do that, then it would get really messy. So, so typically, how long? Oh, so typically, okay. So that was a long answer to a very simple question. The simple answer is about a week during term will we get, will we be able to keep stuff online? Okay. Okay, thanks, Alan. Okay. Okay, our third speaker today is Saverio Nicoloni, I think I pronounced that right, uh, from the University of Pisa in Italy. His presentation is titled Voice over IP Dynamic Resource Allocation in IP Diff Serve Domain, H323 versus COPS Interworking. So, Saverio, over to you. Okay. Can you hear me? No? Okay, <laughs> okay wait. Wait a minute. I'll use this. Okay. Can you hear me? No. Sorry. Uh, I think it's... Okay. One, two. <laughs> okay. So... Uh. Okay. The title of my talk uh, is, as uh, Rina said, Vibe Dynamic Resource Allocation in uh, IP Diff Serve Domain. It's uh, an H323 versus COPS interworking. Uh, okay, going into a brief outline of my talk, 
I will talk about uh, the motivation and targets of our work and uh, I will speak about uh, a typical uh, quality of service provisioning scenario and I will present uh, our proposal of dynamic resource allocation in a, such a scenario uh, as we implemented it in the Moican framework, which is an IST project. Uh, after all, I, I will give you some description about the field trial we are setting up. Uh, it's a very short description because uh, uh, I will show you later on how this field trial can be uh, implemented further on and I will show you some interoperability tests we have performed. Okay, uh, going to the motivation and targets. Uh, as uh, all of you can know, uh, the current internet architecture cannot provide any quality of service. Uh, let's say uh, we may have quality of service in the core network or between the NRNs, but uh, we'd like to have the quality of service pushed all at the edge uh, to the very first mile. So uh, we think that uh, increasing, only increasing the available bandwidth uh, with no strict control on data plane uh, is not enough because it may lead to higher cost uh, and it is a possible source of unfairness. So we, what we want to avoid is this, that you don't want to have a big tube to your house with many bandwidth you may want to have a strict control on that bandwidth. So uh, in our vision, uh, there is the need of an interaction uh, between the control and the data plane. In order to provide the user who is requesting a service uh, with a scalable and on-demand quality of service. So um, it depend depending on the time of the day, you may have, uh, uh, if the available bandwidth is static, is a static one, you may have uh, an underutilization or an overbooking of such bandwidth. So uh, we'd like to uh, provide the users with uh, an automatic quality of service provisioning every time they need it. Okay, uh, what is the scenario we are dealing with? Uh, we are dealing with the diff serve architecture and because uh, diff serve architecture is uh, it, provi it do provides scalability and it may be used to aggregate traffic and uh, it has the complexity which is pushed uh, at the very edge of the internet. In our work, uh, the diff server architecture is supposed to be the interconnecting architecture between, between two or more VoIP administrative zone. Uh, well, uh, I show you a picture and you may do not agree with this picture where a core network is pushed very to the very edge, but this is only a case of our study because you can have the core network which is only a small portion of this figure and you can have at the edge the in-serve uh, peripheral or you can have other domains which are not part of the core network. But we are going to focus uh, in a more general way on the uh, interconnecting point, which is uh, this diff serve border router. Okay, uh, why we are going to focus on this? Because it is su supposed to be the trigger point uh, of all this stuff, all this QS provisioning we are doing. Well, uh, the trigger point is this router, which is supposed to be the default access gateway of your core network of the interconnecting architecture and is supposed to be the device in charge to ask access to the quality of service network and by means of asking permission and asking policies to the bandwidth broker. Okay, what we want to do, I have not said, but our target is to dynamically automate the diff serve mechanisms in order to achieve a resource allocation directly extracting the necessary information of the call directly from the uh, HTTP protocol we are dealing with. 
Well, this is a general approach because we can extract the necessary information even if from the SIP protocol and we are working on it. Uh, you can extract uh, if from the RSVP protocol, which is a resource reservation protocol. Uh, but in this work we are presenting uh, the interaction with H333 uh, because uh, till now H333 is the most deployed uh, multimedia conferencing protocol that many of you may not agree which protocol is going to win in the future. May, someone may talk about the uh, SIP protocol, something like that, but we are dealing with such a protocol too. And we have observed that uh, although uh, resource reservation architecture and uh, mechanism are out of the scope of such protocol, uh, there is a need to analyze the general method and coordination of those protocols with the mechanism of the H3 protocol. And so we uh, try to interoperate with the COPS protocol, which is Common Open Policy Source Protocol, which is a, a query and respond, response protocol used to exchange policy, policies and to handle requests. Okay, the general view of the COPS protocol is here and uh, you may, may have a network node uh, with an enforcement point uh, and you may have a local policy decision point uh, which is optional in this architecture and you do have a policy decision point which acts as the decision element of your architecture. Well, trying to uh, map this view into uh, the scenario I presented earlier, uh, we have tried to <coughs> map these two architectures and going into details and going to see what is inside the diffserve domain, we may e expand the vision and we may map the policy enforcement point and the local policy decision point to the diffserve border router and the policy server is remotized to the bandwidth broker. Okay, uh, how it works? Okay, we have uh, managed to implement both uh, resource allocation model provided by the COPS protocol. Uh, we, have pro uh, we have implemented both outsourcing, which is, um, outsourcing model is a on-demand model and provisioning model, which is a sort of static. Uh, combining those two models, we can gain advantage from the dynamics of the former, from the outsourcing model, and to, from the scalability, scalability provided by the latter. So, uh, when an, an endpoint try to uh, call another endpoint, which is in another H323 zone, we have uh, he has access to the gatekeeper. He, establish a call and if you, if you, depending on what H323 call model you are, you are using, if you root H225 or H245, uh, you pass some signaling to the gatekeeper. This gatekeeper we have modified uh, from the open H323 uh, site. Uh, now forwards those messages to the diff serve border router which ask itself if this uh, call requires a local or remote decision. If it requires a local, a remote decision, then ask by means of COPS protocol to the bandwidth broker. The bandwidth broker reply, and if, the, if it is a positive, a positive answer, it uh, proceed to configure the diff serve router by being, my beans uh, of SNMP protocol. After all, there is a, a sort of tube established. Well, it is, this is not a tube, this is not a, an MPLS tube. It is a pero behavior as in diffser paradigm. And after we have to do a bidirectional configuration, repeating all this stuff on the other side, on the other access domain, and then we may exchange the data traffic between two endpoints with a quality of service enabled connection. 
Okay, detailing, going into more details, what we have done, here is a, a short extract of the signaling scenario we have performed. And uh, what you can see here is the HTTP gatekeeper that forwards every message to the diff serve border router to a proper module um, implemented in the diff serve border router which is able to understand the signaling and is able to extract the necessary information from the data structure inside the H3 protocol. Uh, you can extract the codec, you can extract uh, the source address, the destination address, all those information are carried with the H2.3 protocol. And you may take advantage of this in order to connect, in order to establish a quality of service connection over your diff serve domain. Okay, we have, uh, all this stuff is uh, developed under Linux operative system and is uh, all taken from open source software. There's no commercial stuff over here. And, okay, we have said about the gatekeeper, the diff serve border router, now, as I said, is able to understand the HTTP signaling and is able to um, ask uh, a request in order to ask permission to the diff serve domain to the bandwidth broker. Well, we have here an incoming message request which is intended for authorization scopes. And after all, when we have the information by the H245 messages, we may do the resource allocation request. And the bandwidth broker uh, has the complete knowledge of his diff serve domain, and so he check the administrative, domain, the administrative issues and the resource availability, availability, and then uh, respond with the acknowledgement or a negative acknowledgement. After all this um, message signaling, we can exchange the, the data with, the quality of, with some quality of service. It's a quality of service enabled connection. So uh, what is our trial? We have, this is the trial we have implemented in um, the University of Pisa, which is a single domain one. But we are dealing with a multi-domain uh, interconnection as in the scope of the project. And we now have performed the first functional tests uh, to connect to the, to the Portugal in Lisboa and to Athens. We are using the giant connectivity. Okay, uh, what is all the stuff I have already said? Okay, we have um, developed all from scratch or modifying some uh, open H3 software. We are using only Linux box router. We have no intention of uh, performance evaluation on the router, but we, we want only to, to test the functionalities we the control plane interworking. And we have used some softer phones, some harder phones. As regards as the interoperability test, the current implementation is, was tested with uh, dynamic, with direct and point signaling. And as all of you can know, when you do direct and point signaling, you have only few information about the the call signaling because all the signaling is exchanged, all the H225 messages and the H245 messages are exchanged only between the two endpoints. And we have test also with the, in the call signaling channel routing and the call signaling call, cha call control channel routing. Okay, we have not implemented um, the procedure needed to establish this, this quality of service connection in the case of the endpoints are using the fast connect procedure and the H245 tunneling procedure. And here are a kind of big table with some tests we have performed. Uh, these tests are intended to show only the 
unidirectional uh, configuration from the caller to the called. For example, if you call from net meeting to one of these clients, you will have always a success in the test. Uh, other tests uh, were not uh, so successful because of not, the not implementing of the fast connect and the H245 tunneling procedure, but I think in uh, the next month we are about to complete the implementation and we are ready to, to test and to be, become successful also this no. <laughs> okay, as a conclusion, I've showed an example of VoIP dynamic resource allocation architecture for DivServe. And mm, we are working, as I said, also on SIP protocol and resource reservation protocol in order to make this architecture as general as possible. It, it no matter of what kind of, let's say, access protocol you use, it may be SIP, it may be H223, you will have a module, a specified a software module, which may understand such protocol and is able to ask a quality of service for you in the diff serve border router. Obviously, this overloads a little bit the diff serve border router, but we are testing how much uh, the overload is. What about the scalability issues? The scalability issues were solved taking advantage from the combination of outsourcing and provisioning scenario in COPS protocol. The field trial was tested with several clients and the control plane was okay. <laughs> we, we, we do have a configuration of the routers and the call is established. And now we are going to to test also the data plane with respect to the quality of service issues as uh, we are in connection with some pr other IST projects uh, such as Aquila and Sequin and we, they are expecting those results from us. If you like some other references are in the paper and that's all about thanks. Okay, thank you Severio. Okay, do we have any questions for Sawario? One question back there, Francois? Um, yeah, good question. Mike's just on its way. <laughs> About the principle of the bandwidth broker, yeah. uh, you know that uh, this approach of having a bandwidth broker is sometimes criticized for several reasons. One is that it is a single point of failure in the network, and more importantly, when you have multiple domains, each with their own bandwidth brokers, you need to have a protocol for inter-bandwidth broker uh, dialogue. Uh, and so what is your, your, uh, your comment on this in particular? Uh, with respect to the possible other approach, which would be a decentralized uh, bandwidth brokering using, for example, a distributed RSVP. Okay. Uh, we are taking account uh, inter-bandwidth broker communication, and uh, this is all the stuff related to the interconnection of island. When we are, we are now doing only functional testing, but in the next month, we have to do connect this, those islands and we have an, in, an inter bandwidth broker communication which is mainly, as you said, another protocol. And you may overtake this uh, using, as regards as the single point of failure, you may overtake this using such an er an hierarchy of bandwidth broker and you may have some higher bandwidth broker which is splitting the load over one or more bandwidth broker. But uh, we have not considered to distribute, distribute this because uh, we are considering small, also small pr service provider and we don't know if a big bandwidth broker may fail in, the, in, the, 
in that case. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Severia. Okay, our final speaker for this session is Ludek Matiaska, I hope I've pronounced that right, from uh, Chestnut in the Czech Republic. Uh, his presentation is titled The Grid Job Monitoring Service. Okay, Ludek, it's all yours. Yeah, I'm just looking where the slides are. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thanks for the int My heart? Yeah, hopefully, yes. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name, in, it, in fact, is Ludek Matiska, but <laughs> I know that it's uh, difficult to pronounce it for people outside the Czech Republic or the Central European U region. And I will be speaking about the grid monitoring, uh, job, grid job monitoring service, which is a kind of a very important part of the whole uh, grid infrastructure software. And in fact, the motivation came from two uh, related areas. The first one is a job tracking in a grid environment. It's too complex environment to do the job tracking, I mean following what's happening with your job during uh, the processing from submission to the end of the life of the job within the grid. The, the environment is too complex to be done uh, the tracking uh, manually. The uh, environment also requires responsibility dele delegation, which means that not always you have direct access to parts of the grid environment or grid infrastructure where the job is coming through, like the computing element themselves where the jobs are really processed, doesn't allow direct access, uh, say direct login into them, so you can't follow the job and you need other means to see what's happening with, with individual jobs. Also, the individual components have an independent or can take independent decisions, and you are in no control of them, and you, have, you need tools to follow what's happening with your job, say, to, to decide to cancel the job when the independent uh, decisions are wrong. And also security issues where, again, you may have no access, no direct access to some parts, and you just need some tools to follow what's going on. And the other part or the other area of motivation or where the motivation came from is support for parallel and multi-part jobs. A situation when you have a job decomposed to many subtasks, which are run more or less independently within the grid, and there is no way for you to follow individual jobs by themselves, themselves, and you need some aggregate functions to be able to follow what's going with the aggregates of the uh, jobs or the parts of the total job. So this is motivation. The picture shows a kind of a job movement within the uh, grid infrastructure itself. The job starts here at the user interface and then follows somehow through resource broker to job submission service to the computing element and probably the results are going back again to the user interface which is the primary point of the grid interaction with the end user. And you see the kind of uh, bookkeeping service, which is the service which takes care of the job tracking, in fact interacts with all these elements, all these components, and is used in a way to store the information of what happened with, indi with, with individual job between individual components, and the user interface interacts directly with the bookkeeping service to uh, say, collect information about individual job or job uh, aggregation and put it uh, to front of the user. So what we are responsible for within the data grid project is this logging and bookkeeping service, which is responsible for collection of events associated with job life, like what, when and how you submitted a job, 
which resources were found for your job, when the job started on a computing element, when job finished, and with what is the state of the uh, uh, of, of it when, when it finished. All these informations are stored as events within uh, bookkeeping and logging databases. We will see the difference between these two later on. And in fact, the service should provide a job state to the end users. What we are collecting are events associated with the job while we are providing the job state. What it is? Here we see, at least hopefully, a kind of a job life cycle where we see the individual states where the, which can the job attain, like submitted, scheduled, running, done, and cleared. There are some specific uh, states which, we, uh, which, which are necessary for the complete understanding of it. But the most important are connected by arrows which describe the events associated with the transition from one state to another. And what's collected within the bookkeeping service are these events, and the bookkeeping service itself is responsible for computation of actual job state for any individual job known to the service. The service architecture has two APIs, local logger service and a database servers. The APIs are for logging events into the service and they naturally retrieving the results from it. It's better described by the schema where we see the API here which store, which is used for logging any individual event and we see the possible sources of events here. The event is transmitted to something which we call a local logger. This is a part which runs on the same machine where the event producer runs and the local logger store the data in a local persistent log file for persistency and in the same time it sends the same data to the interlogger which is a part of the whole service which transmits the data from the local say machine or system to a database which runs somewhere within the uh, grid and which keeps the data either forever, this is the responsibility of the logging server, or during the lifetime, during the existence of the job within the uh, grid. So what we see here is a fork where the interlogger in fact sends the same events or mostly same events to two more or less independent servers. And now we see the last part, this is the logging producer API, which is responsible for uh, taking care of end user requests for individual state information about uh, jobs. The architecture, general architecture, uh, uses uh, ULM based message format. It's the, it's, we, we well, say, we use the NetLogger ideas for this, and we have prescribed a set of semantic rules how the messages should be composed to be really understandable by the server to retrieve the information for end user. The local logger service is in fact, as we had seen, uh, composed from the local logger daemon, the interlogger daemon, and the local persistency responsibility, which is represented usually by the local disk file. And the data transfer to database servers, uh, the bookkeeping server, I mean the, the two database servers, are the bookkeeping server, which takes care of the, all the information associated with the job and its behavior within the, uh, within the grid during the job lifetime. And the information is purged from the bookkeeping server when the job is finished and all the information about it I mean, the output files, standard error uh, files, and so on, are retrieved by user. Uh, on the contrary, the logging server serves for eternally persistent, I mean, eternally in quotes, persistent information about jobs. So the user is able or should be able to retrieve information of jobs which, that finished weeks or months uh, ago. 
for, say, retrospection of what happened there, or looking uh, what kind of uh, uh, parameters were used when the job was submitted. The logging API is very simple. It's composed from just one function, digilog event, and all the uh, complexity is hidden within the prescribed semantic rules how the uh, event should be uh, composed, or the information about events should be composed. And it always stores date, time, event producer, and job ID. I will speak about it uh, slightly uh, later. And what's important, it's always authenticated. So the authenticity of the user who is issuing or who is storing the events is always confirmed. Server API, uh, API uh, the state, as I said, the events are stored, but state is retrieved. The state is computed on demand currently, so it's recomputed whenever you ask about your own job. And uh, the API provides three core functions, list of users' jobs, job status for a given job, and list of all events. In that case, nothing is recomputed. All the events are dumped from the database to the end user. And again, this is authenticated in such a way that only owner of the job, the, the, people who, the, the person who uh, store the events, can retrieve the information. Uh, what we had to develop is a kind of a grid-wide global identifier, which we currently call job ID. Uh, and this is because this is the only piece of information which the user has about its job. And it should, in some way, incorporate the information where the other info information is really stored. So currently, we use the host name of the bookkeeping server as a part of the job ID with a unique string which is used to distinguish individual jobs. Uh, so the uh, identifier is truly unique, uh, grid-wide. And currently, our bookkeeping server speaks kind of a restricted HTTPS protocol. So just using the job ID, you can uh, ask directly the bookkeeping server for, say, status of your uh, job. And it, it includes more other uh, information like the resource broker uh, data or so, but we hope that most of this information related things will be later on delegated on the information uh, infrastructure of the grid itself. The security within the book, looking at bookkeeping service are very important, or security, uh, security consideration, because uh, just having access to the logging and bookkeeping databases, you can in fact retrieve the information of what kind of job, which parameters, who, when, and where uh, submitted uh, some jobs, which may be rather uh, important and sensitive information. So we use strong authentication and we uh, use only secure channel communication between any individual part of the logging and bookkeeping service. And currently, only users who really are storing the events are able to uh, retrieve the data about uh, their jobs. We hope that with the development of the uh, authorization service within the grid and data grid communities, we will be able to delegate more rights to end user to retrieve, say, friends data or team data. Currently, this is uh, forbidden. And also, the user is associated with job ID on the first authenticated event. This is important because uh, the events may not be stored in a timely order. It may happen that when you submit a job, the user interface has no access to the bookkeeping service. So the first event of a job submission is not actually stored in the database, but subsequent events related to, say, to the resource broker work are stored there before the first event really comes uh, over the network to the bookkeeping service. So uh, the first event with a new job ID with associated personality identities, currently it's a PKI uh, certificate, 
uh, gets this association and later on all uh, subsequent stores to the bookkeeping server are checked against this uh, first time authentication. So you are not in this way, you are more or less securing, or we are more or less securing that the uh, events about particular job are not, uh, say, intermixed uh, from uh, hostile people who are willing to, say, destroy the, the information in the database. And the, the, this is important, again, because the job ID itself is not a secure, it's more or less a public information. So that's, uh, and this is important when we are trying to move this to other models of, say, information uh, infrastructure, uh, because we need from the beginning uh, secure channels and strong authentication. Uh, this is important for this part because currently what we are doing is a trial of RGMA. The GMA means grid monitoring architecture uh, integration. This is a work in progress where we would like to lower the database load, which is currently as a high because people are pulling the database to get information about their job and the changes of the state of their job. So we would like to provide a notification service which will allow users to just register to the job state changes and to allow also better integration with other information services which are looked for uh, the data grid uh, environment and the bookkeeping service, uh, bookkeeping service, or looking at bookkeeping service is in fact an information service but currently not integrated is in, within the grid information services of Globus or uh, the GMA. Here we see that the first trials are touching just here, so they are influencing this part of the API, or in fact they are extending it, especially with the notification service and with the service to provide a job state on, uh, not only on demand, but generated uh, on the fly by the bookkeeping server, storing it into the uh, RGMA infrastructure, so it's available to the user without actually curing the bookkeeping server. The last thing which we are currently doing uh, is our R uh, extensions for the logging and bookkeeping service because we discovered and also the end users discovered that the logging and bookkeeping service can be very valuable to store user-defined attributes. The information which users associate with a particular job like description of what kind of experiment it is, uh, some other externalities which are not directly associated with the job, but which are very, very important when the jobs are later on retrieved or the information about jobs is collected to see some patterns in, in, in the work of individual uh, people. So we are trying to support these activities by extending the primary model with the user-defined attributes which will allow to store additional information associated directly with the job and to retrieve either job collections or to create a specific queries based on these user attributes, not only on the job state or events which are uh, generated from within the grid infrastructure. The other extension is Synchronous API because currently all uh, the, the whole model is asynchronous. You issue the event, uh, the block event uh, call, but this call returns immediately and it's a responsibility of the middleware to transport the actual data from the issuer to the server. And as I said, it may happen that the data are not stored in a timely order. But for some specific reasons, you may want to be sure to wait till you know that the data you send, the event information you are, st you are willing to store in the bookkeeping server is really committed by the bookkeeping database. So the synchronous API will provide or more or less is providing exactly this service. And the synchronous API is currently sought as a 
piece to support the application level job checkpointing where the information for the job checkpoint will be stored in a bookkeeping server and naturally if you are speaking about the checkpointing you need to be sure that the data you would like to reuse for checkpointing are truly stored within some persistent database currently within the bookkeeping server so that's the extensions and another thing which we are looking for is a support for job partitioning like you have a task which decompose itself into many smaller subtasks hundreds or even thousands and you need to have tools to identify both individual tasks which we can do and the collections for which we are currently developing a notion of a group ID from the Unix world which will be able to uh, work with the whole job collections and which will also uh, allow to <coughs> sorry allow to create hierarchies of sub jobs like one job creates one level of hierarchy and any one of these another layer and so on and you can either use the whole uh, picture or any part or in not absolutely any but as, as the hierarchy was created in the same way you can pinpoint on individual subparts of the whole uh, hierarchy and using this on based on this we will support aggregate queries which means say give me the information of all uh, how many or the percentage of jobs already done within a particular group this is exactly the kind of of queries which we uh, expect for this so the conclusion is that the uh, logging and bookkeeping service is becoming a very important part of the information infrastructure of the data grid project and in general of any grid related project and it provides job tracking persistent event storage and job state provision information about what's going on and uh, the actual current future current and future work is better GMA integration in such a way that the logging and bookkeeping service will become a part, integral part of a general grid monitoring architecture. We would like to add or to collaborate with those who are working on it to add authorization to allow more advanced queries on, uh, uh, on the information stored in these uh, servers and to allow collective operations on sets or groups of jobs. That's uh, again important for end users to fully utilize the information which is stored uh, within the bookkeeping service. And that's all. Okay, thank you, Lydia. <laughs> Are there any questions? Uh, <laughs> no. In that case, thank you to all our speakers today, and uh, just a short announcement: the bus will pick everybody up at 6:30 for those who want to attend the gala evening. Thank you.